Welcome to Global Political Economy Visiting Lectures session. I am very happy to introduce you Professor Ratika Desai. Uh, Ratika uh, writes on uh, the shape of global political economy uh, for a significant amount of time. Uh, and she has lots of publications in this field. Um, and also lots of talks and videos I can see in the I internet. Now we are lucky to hear her about her recent book, Geopolitical Economy, uh, After U.S. Hegemony, Globalization and Empire. She will uh, talk for about 40-45 minutes and then we will have questions and answers. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much and thank you all for coming. I'm <coughs> really pleased to, uh, to be here and to, to talk a little bit about my, my book. Um, what I want to do today, as you can imagine, um, a book has usually a lot of different things in it, a lot of ideas and, and so on. And uh, In a, a talk which is, you know, 35, 40 minutes long or 45 minutes long, you can only cover so much. And so what I want to do is try and communicate to you some of the main points. <coughs> uh, and then we can, uh, I, I hope to leave a lot of time for questions and answers because it, uh, the main points are quite a diverse set of points. And I usually find that with every audience, they pick up on some different matter to investigate further, which is always, which makes it also quite interesting and exciting. Um, so as I say, I'll try and keep my presentation fairly short so that we have lots of time for Q&A. And I believe that uh, something afterwards as well, we can all continue the discussion in an informal way after uh, 6 o'clock as well. Okay, so um, this is the title of my book, uh, Geopolitical Economy uh, After US Hegemony, Globalization and Empire. And one of the main uh, purposes of this book is to criticize what I take to be, or what I call in my book, cosmopolitan views of the world order, economically cosmopolitan views of the world order. Um, I'm not against cosmopolitanism as a kind of subjective virtue, but I am against the idea, which is, a, which is the main idea of economic cosmopolitanism, that the world economy is best thought of as a single unit. Okay? Um, because I feel that this view, which lies at the heart of the two main views that we have recently had dominate our views of the world order, uh, namely globalization and empire, they are wrong in good part. I mean, and one of the ways in which they are wrong, of course, there are many ways they are wrong, but one of the ways in which they are wrong is that they need, they, they failed to anticipate and cannot explain the rise of multipolarity. The reason is very simple. Multipolarity is the work of assertive states engaging in hot housing development, engaging in state-directed development, or what one writer called contender development, uh, and what another writer called combined development, that is a variety of forms of, of, of state-led development, in order to contest the existing international division of labor in order that their countries would have a, a more favorable place within it. China is only the most successful of such states today, but there are others. We talk about the BRICS, we talk about the, a wider category called the emerging economies and so on. And in practically all of these cases, it is the action of states in challenging the existing distribution of economic power, political power internationally that gives us multipolarity. Globalization and empire can neither, neither anticipated it nor can they explain it for one simple reason. If states were central in it, neither globalization nor empire give any role to states. In globalization, no state matters. The world is a single seamless economic unit. It's division into a plurality of national economies governed by discrete national governments is completely, I mean, it is at, at best a cultural phenomena and at worst a completely irrelevant one. In empire, on the other hand, only one state matters, namely the US. What the US does governs everything, everybody else is inconsequential. Therefore, in neither case is the division of the world into a plurality of nation states a meaningful fact. And this is what we are confronted with in a more insistent way than ever before with the rise of multipolarity. And my other point, of course, is that things like multipolarity don't just emerge in one loud thunderclap sort of overnight. They have been gestating for a very long time, which means that globalization and empire are not just irrelevant. They were never accurate. <coughs> 
the present crisis, to take another example, is neither global nor imperial. Globalization would uh, ask us to expect that um, we all suffer together and we all prosper together. Whereas in reality, what the post-crisis scenario has been is that there, are a, there is a small group of countries, which uh, my, some of my colleagues and I have humorously decided to call the no longer growing countries. And uh, there are the rest, there are a number of very, very successful economies scattered all over the world, which are still posting rather impressive growth. They're very different, and I'll, we can talk about them uh, in more detail later on, but they are still doing that. Um, so in that sense, this is a globalization, certainly. Uh, it's not a global crisis. It is also not an imperial crisis, because that ideology uh, uh, sort of uh, leads us to expect that if the United States sneezes, the rest of the world catches pneumonia. Again, this has not been the case. The US and the West are mired in a period of extremely low growth, whereas the rest of the world is doing very well, thank you. And that's why we have been talking about multipolarity. We have been talking about the shift in the world center of gravity to other parts of the world, etc. So what I want to do today in outline is I want to make, I want to continue my introductory remarks for a little bit longer. And then I want to present to you what I see as the three main arguments my book makes. Okay. Um, and the three main arguments are the number one, as, as you and probably now appreciate uh, already, given what I've said already, which is the, that the materiality of nations argument. That is to say that the funny thing is that, particularly with the rise of post-colonial theory and post-structuralism and so on, we have had a lot of talk about nations and nationalism in recent decades, but practically each one of them encourages us to imagine that nation states are basically cultural. Whereas, in fact, what we need to appreciate, as uh, certainly some people do, and the developmental states literature does, some of you may have come across developmental states, people like Ha Jun Chang, Robert Wade, Alice Amsden, etc., but many others as well, they have uh, uh, historically argued that states matter economically. And we will go again, I will describe, I will fill this argument out. Secondly, and a, oh sorry, and, 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 and a concomitant of the idea that states matter is that you cannot understand the spread of capitalism around the world and also the spread of productive capacity around the world without taking seriously the old Bolshevik notion of uneven and combined development. This, by the way, it's, it's a, a, a to my mind, and as far as I know, it's originally a Bolshevik notion, uh, some, and, and it, it can also be traced further back to Marx and Engels. But other people may have also thought of it, and my point is not so much that um, it is necessarily has to originate there. But I do think that the Bolsheviks were the first people to really try to use it to understand history and historical developments in a very, very serious way. In a way, it, for them, it was a way of ma ma matter of understanding their own political practice. Uh, we can discuss that. So uneven and combined development is a very central motif throughout my book. The second argument, if you accept this I these ideas, then it inevitably follows, as I show in my book, that in fact, um, contrary to the idea of hegemony stability theory, the various theories that assume that capitalism can be and should be thought of, the history of capitalism can be and should be thought of as a succession of hegemonies, a succession of hegemonic powers that uh, uh, successively organize the productive expansion of capitalism. We need to reject that idea uh, and instead put in its place another idea which is the understanding that the, that the dominance, uh, since I reject the very idea of hegemony, uh, I do sometimes use the word hegemony, but it's uh, more in an ironic fashion. But anyway, some kind of dominance of the first industrial capitalist country in the world was inevitable. British dominance was inevitable. But thereafter, it was also unrepeatable. Um, one of the ways in which I like to introduce my book to some audiences, those who are particularly interested in the theories of hegemony, etc., is I like to say, uh, you've heard people say that the United States is hegemonic. You've heard other people say that the United States was once hegemonic, but is no longer hegemonic. But you've never heard anybody argue that the United States was never hegemonic. And this is what I argue in my book. 
Um, and so I, I basically, in fact, one of the central chapters in the book uh, uh, looks at the emergence of hegemony stability theory and the reasons why we talk about it today. And the final argument of the book is that globalization and empire, the two discourses that have dominated our understanding of the world order uh, in the 1990s and uh, 2000s respectively, are not theories of, about the world. They are discourses of power, of a certain type of power. In particular, they are the discourses of not US hegemony, so much as the last two attempts by the United States to fashion something like hegemony in the world. So I will explain uh, uh, this to you. And then finally, because as I will show, what the United States was attempting to do in trying to fashion something like hegemony was effectively to try to maintain the dollar's position as the world's currency. I will talk about exactly why we, sh we exactly what has really happened with the dollars. Uh, we, we, uh, and, and, and also, I will show that in fact its role has declined and we can expect it to continue to decline, in fact, possibly even end. In, in some large or small catastrophe, um, and what then we should take from all this. So that's my, uh, my lecture in rough outline. By the way, I should add one other thing perhaps uh, here. When I started writing my book uh, about more than four years ago, um, I, I, and I ha had my idea was to actually write a critique of globalization discourse. Um, now, I should add, of course, that, uh, and, 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 and in that version, of course, the kind of prehistory of that book is, goes back a long way, because um, ever since globalization discourse emerged, and it emerged only in the mid to late 1990s, but um, most people don't recognize that, and I, again, I can show you that. <laughs> I have always been a critic of globalization discourse. As a scholar, I was trained, I was a, a, a scholar of comparative politics to begin with, and I was trained in a way of understanding uh, 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 every, the politics of every country in connection with its political economy. And so therefore, all the traditions of comparative national political economy were very live to me. Traditions that go into developmental state literature that I have already ma mentioned, uh, so uh, but also the varieties of capitalism, models of capitalism, uh, other such uh, you know, including varieties of welfare states and so on. All of these literatures take very seriously the idea that while we, the, you may have one abstract category called capitalism, each individual capitalist country has a very unique and historically evolved set of institutions um, uh, and, and which states, of course, play a very, very central role. So given that, the ideology that somehow states had overnight ceased to matter was always very peculiar to me. And I belong to a bunch of, uh, a group of people of which I was completely subordinate and derivative member, if at all. Uh, people who questioned the notion of globalization, and they showed on the basis of statistics relating to a whole slew of, uh, of, 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 of phenomena, whether it was trade, finance, investment, uh, multinational corporations, migration, you name it, <clears throat> they all showed that global on all these counts, globalization was not cut out, was not what it was being, uh, not what, what it was supposed to be, not what it was touted as being. But by the late 1990s, I had sort of also come to a slightly different point in my thinking about this. I said, all right, I mean, this work has been done. It has been done as far as I can tell convincingly. And by the way, I have another whole lecture, if you ever want me to give it, which I regularly give my students about exactly, you know, this marshalling of evidence against globalization. But then I thought, in fact, okay, so if all of these things are true, and I do take them to be true, there is another question that arises, which I don't see anybody asking, which is that if it is true that globalization never happened, then why did we suddenly start talking about globalization in the 1990s? Where did the discourse come from? What function did it serve? So the original conception of my book was I was going to use hegemony stability theory, which in that time I subscribed to, just like most other people. I thought, okay, it must be true. You know, all these leading, very intelligent people are talking about it, so that something must be something to it. So I was going to show that globalization was just a phase in America's management of its declining hegemony. At this point, even though I thought it declining, I at least conceded that at one point such a hegemony existed. 
The more I looked into this matter, however, in the course of writing my book, I found that you could not really sustain any kind of argument that the United States was ever hegemonic. Typically, people refer to the period of the 50s and 60s as being, you know, the great era when America was hegemonic and then it began to slowly slide thereafter. Uh, in fact, its originators, the originators of hegemony stability theory, whether you take him, take that originator to be Charles Kindleberger or the world systems theorist or whoever, they all have some kind of similar uh, uh, understanding of US hegemony. And I found that even, or perhaps even especially in the case of the 50s and 60s, you cannot sustain this. And that's why the book suddenly became, it now had two separate targets. So, um, yeah, so, 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 uh, that's, that's where I'm coming from, so that it has become both a critique showing where globalization really fits in, uh, in terms of the discourses of American power, um, and also explains, uh, in a sense, uh, 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 how US hegemony never really existed, and that by 2008, we are no longer, so, so you know, UK enjoyed some kind of dominance, if you want to call it hegemony, I'm not going to argue for very long, you can do that if you like, but, there was no such thing as US hegemony. All you had were a series of attempts, each one of which failed within a few years, succeeded by another one. And my point is after 2008, I doubt that the US can make convincing attempts even to remount something like dollar dominance around the world. So um, this is, uh, in broad terms, my argument. So that's why I'm going to talk about so, why? Uh, so, so some of these things I have already pointed out. So, the multipolar mo moment has upended both of these discourses, and I call them cosmopolitan discourses. Um, so, um, yeah, and in a sense, in arriving, so the idea or the, or the title geopolitical economy actually occurred to me to, at a very late stage in my writing of the book because. Um, uh, uh, you know, I have was I function. You know, after I dropped the original title, which was "When Was Globalization," it was a um, reference to an old article by Raymond Williams. I don't know how many of you like uh, cultural theory, but I was, and still am very much into cultural theory. And he wrote a wonderful article called "When Was Modernism," and it was about periodization. Anyhow, so I dropped this title because once the book expanded, it no longer described what the book was about. And then I worked with a number of very dis unsatisfactory titles until suddenly one day. It occurred to me that what I was really doing could only be described as geopolitical economy. And, and then once I had this <coughs> idea, I realized that it was important in at least uh, in, in, my, in terms of my relationship with fi at, at least five different bodies of thought with which I, in which I was at <coughs> one point deeply invested, but which I have now at least, if not frontally criticized, like hegemony stability theory, at least I have um, uh, transcended <coughs> in some fashion. And so those ideas are, are, are as follows. And in each case, the, the term uh, geopolitical economy, or I emphasize a different part of the term geopolitical economy. So uh, as I told you, I was already deeply immersed in national, comparative national uh, political economy. But of course, uh, and while I still continue to be immersed in that, in order to understand certain things, you will have to emphasize the world element of it. It is geopolitical economy, not just political economy. Um, hegemony, stability theory, and world systems theory, uh, of course, I reject entirely. And in large part, while I agree with them, that of course one must have at least one level of analysis, which is a world level of analysis. I don't disagree with that. But the thing is, when even the most erudite of them, like the world systems theorists, do world systems theory, what they do not contain within their own uh, 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 theoretical system is some notion of the contestation of power within the world system. So for them, there is power, there is a, 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 there is a given hegemony which keeps cer things certain way and eventually there is a transition from that hegemony but they are a little bit fuzzy about exactly how this transition actually takes place. How, how is power contested and so on and also of course given that they don't take the contestation of power very seriously, they tend to have a cyclical view of hegemony, where one hegemony is replaced by another hegemony, but, of course, the history of imperialism as a structure never changes. 
in fact single powers will continue to dominate the world which of course I also don't agree with. So in order to indicate the contestation I emphasize the geopolitical part of it. International political economy was a field of study that emerged in the 1970s and by the way its history is very deeply connected with the story I have to tell of the non-existence of US hegemony. Because of course in 1971 the United States closed the gold window uh, and when this was done and currency started flowing there was a lot of uh, turbulence in the international uh, 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 arena uh, and also of course a lot of financial turbulence both of which are deeply connected with US uh, uh, with US attempts at hegemony as I will show but international political economy emerges at this point to say you cannot understand what's going on in the world without having a very systematic interconnection between the understanding that in, uh, international relations or international politics brings and international economics and the idea was to marry the two but in reality this never happened in reality what IPE tended to do was to accept the neoclassical conception of economics in which indeed which is indeed a cosmopolitan conception because they tend to encourage us to think about the economy as separate from politics so that the states <coughs> uh, 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 do not matter and that morality does not matter, etc. And then politics tends to be reduced to a residual. So that, for example, articles about uh, in, within IPE about trade will take it for granted that free trade is a wonderful thing. And then they will consign to the realm of poli the, their pol the political part of their understanding all sorts of uh, 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 points about how why we are not at free trade and this is the result of special interests who are politicking and creating protection for themselves etc. It's a very typical type of the discourse. So in that sense against IPE I would talk, I would emphasize the political part that is to say that politics has to be integrated much more fully and frontally in it. The character of states needs to be understood. Their capacity and their willingness to intervene in the economies in particular ways needs to be understood much better. To give you a very small example, Britain, the British state, as you know, it is the state that uh, of the country that uh, was the first industrial capitalist country in the world, the, the homeland of the industrial revolution, etc. But how many of you are aware that you cannot understand the history of British policy without understanding that despite the, being the home of the industrial revolution, the British state has historically been dominated by a commercial and financial sections of its bourgeoisie, which means that particularly since 1870, but even before that, the interests of industry were always sacrificed at the altar of financial interest. And it continues to be so. And that is why the more than 130 year, is 100, yeah, 140, 40, whatever, 45 year long relative decline of the British economy has never been fully reversed. Just to give you a small example, Marxist economics. Um, There are a lot of Marxists, as you know, they're, they're, they're in, in, the, in, in, in the world. Many of them are academics. Of course, within the larger academy, they are marginalized, but they, are, they do exist. And one would have thought that they would uh, continue to keep alive the tradition of Marxist thinking um, in order that we may acquire from it a critical perspective on the world economy and economies in general, capitalist economies. In reality, I discovered much more keenly than I ever had before in the course of writing this book that the vast majority of Marxist economists are economists first and Marxist second. And because of that, they take neoclassical economics mark, uh, uh, conception of the economy as a given. They do not question it. Indeed, on the strength of that, they actually argue that Marx was wrong. His value theory was wrong, that his ideas about the crisis of capitalism were wrong, etc. So practically everything that makes Marxist economics distinctive is rejected by them, which is something that actually once you realize that this is what's going on, one is thunderstruck. Why do they call themselves Marxists if they say that the main things that Marx talked about were wrong? Don't ask me that question. We will go into completely different conversations. So, there and and of course uh, the other, I mean they do a lot of things wrong but basically they also do not see that Marx actually stood in a profound continuity a critical continuity but a profound continuity with the entire tradition of classical political economy that preceded Marx and also that you cannot understand um, the, the, the 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 intellectual history 
of the social sciences and humanities after Marx without understanding Marx. So you have to fit Marx <coughs> into that larger uh, intellectual tradition. And, uh, it's critical as well as its, um, its uh, non uh, mainstream parts. So against that, I emphasize that political economy, or all of classical political economy, takes some version of value theory very seriously, takes some version of the labor theory of value very seriously. Um, and similarly, Marxist international relations, which, by the way, to in our time is, is still uh, largely the work of people who do not really do political economy. It is basically the work of social scientists who leave the work of economics to somebody else. And of course, if you are serious about political economy and geopolitical economy, you cannot do this. In, you, have to un, you have to have a good understanding of the political economy of countries in order to understand their international relations. This is a very, very important thing. So against them, so against Marxist economics, I emphasize political economy. And against Marxist international relations, I emphasize the, the fact that you have to put political economy back into it and also understand it at a world level. So, and, and then I, I say one other thing about this. In, when I coined the term geopolitical economy, I became very aware that it sounds like the name of a discipline or sub-discipline. Uh, and I would say, and, and I, I was not displeased with that, I was serious about that, that there, there should be a new way of approaching the world order. And I thought, all right, if this is a new way of approaching the world order, what is the intellectual lineage that I would trace? And certainly for myself, I would trace the entire lineage of classical political economy up to and including Marx. Uh, but then I would take out of it what I call the Ricardian fictions. Um, and then, and, and, and the neoclassical economics which based itself on Ricardian fictions. Ricardian fictions refer particularly to the idea that of free trade and free markets. Okay, so domestically you should have a free market economy and internationally you should believe in free trade and those are the two main, main Ricardian nostrums. And neoclassical economics continues to believe in that. So you have, so you have Marx up to, Ricard, well, Ricardo preceded Marx, but you had Marx as a critic, critic of Ricardo, and then neoclassical economics, which you, I would also reject, I would expel the entire tradition from my conception of what I would look to, but I would reintroduce into my tradition all the critics of neoclassical economics, of which Keynes was the greatest. Um, and so we can uh, come back to that, but this would be the, and of course the developmental state theorists, and, and, and so on, I would include all of those into it. So. Um, so here then, what the way I would um, explain uh, uh, certain of things as well is um, the, a couple of other things I should explain. In relating to Marx or, or, or in, in rejecting Marx's political economy, what often happens is that um, the main writers within a Marxist paradigm, they tend to assume that Marx also had a cosmopolitan conception of a free market, free trade conception of capitalism. And I contest this and I have written both in my book as well as in other articles about how this is actually quite problematic. In fact, Marx does not have a cosmopolitan conception of capitalism. Marx lived at a time when a series of countries were beginning to challenge Britain's industrial supremacy precisely on the basis of what we have called combined development, etc. So he could not have been um, unaware of that. Um, so in that, and, and you know, most people say, in fact, oh, well, Marx has a, of course, Marx has a cosmopolitan conception of capitalism. Just read the first few pages of Capital, of the Communist Manifesto. Well, right, if you read only the first few pages of the Communist Manifesto, you will, you know, hear all this talk about how the bourgeoisie creates a world market and undermines, you know, pre-capitalist relations and all these wonderful things, practically a lionization of the bourgeoisie. But... Of course, if you just keep reading just a few pages later, you will see how much he emphasizes the state. Um, in terms of geopolitical economy, the way I think about it, this particular uh, 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 expression, which is um, here, oops, um, highlighted in red, the relations of producing nations, uh, is for me quite important. This is how I conceive geopolitical economy. That's how you have to try to understand the relations, uh, understand international relations. Um, and uh, it comes from an ext the very uh, last couple of pages of the Grundrisse, which is not a text that most people, even many Marxists, actually manage to plow through. But at the very end of the Grundrisse is a short piece that Marx has written on Henry Carey. Henry Carey was a mercantilist American economist. 
and Marx is, you know, partly praising him for understanding exactly what was at stake <coughs> in things, uh, what was at stake for America in the world economy, but also criticizing him for being a bourgeois economist. And so, being a bourgeois economist, Marx says, for Kerry, everything that happens within the domestic economy is the realm of harmony. In particular, of course, such a thinker wants to deny the disharmony of class relations, relations between capitalists and workers, etc., etc. But he says, of course, for Kerry, the domestic economy is complete harmony, and the disharmony of economic relations occurs entirely at the international level. Right? Why? Because in, at this point in time, in the middle of the 19th century, America is engaged in a project of beginning to contest British industrial supremacy. So Marx says, with Carey, the harmony of bourgeois relations of production ends with the most complete disharmony of these relations on the grandest terrain where they appear. So the world market. So the world market here becomes the grandest terrain on which the contradictions of capitalism work themselves out. Yeah? Um, and also on this terrain, these contradictions appear in their grandest development. Okay, this is another very key point. I think this is also worth taking seriously. At least as an indicator, it's not exactly written in rigorous social scientific language, but it indicates a part. So the, and, and in their grandest development, and so the contradictions of capitalism on the grandest terrain where they appear, in their grandest development are the relations of producing nations. Okay. This is the key point I want to make. I, I won't go into that other second red bit, but, or third red bit, but I will come back to it later. So the three arguments in my book are actually embedded inside each other like Russian dolls. The, there is the most general argument, and then from the, um, and then the second argument is, in a sense, a further development of one of its major implications, and then the third development follows a third argument follows logically from it. So the first argument is the materiality of nation states, and therefore the importance of uneven and combined development as a way of understanding the mutual relations of capitalist states with one another. The second uh, argument then is a further development of one of its aspects, which is that in this context then if a single country ever managed to dominate the world, it must be the first industrial capitalist country. And this is not unlike the privileges enjoyed by the first, uh, uh, the, 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 the first person to produce something. So imagine I am the first producer of tomatoes in a given field, then for a while at least, until the rest of you cotton on that this is a good and thriving business, I will have dominance over the tomato market for tomatoes. Right? Very simple. So similarly you have, uh, 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 but, but of course this is only a matter of time before the rest of you realize that this is very lucrative business and some of you will get into the production of tomatoes and some of uh, some of those people will actually become more competitive than I am and they will all together undermine my hold on the market. Yeah, this is just very uh, a simple point. And therefore, uh, if, uh, uh, so the US, uh, the dominance of the UK as the first industrial capitalist country in the world market was inevitable. But equally, once it was undermined, it could not be replaced by anything. And therefore, also one of the other major implications of my book is that we have to rethink our understanding of imperialism. Imperialism is not some kind of unchanging structure. I certainly do not believe that uh, the, in, uh, you know uh, one of the one of the ways of, of saying that is to say that in the second half of the 20th century, when many countries in the world became independent, this was only a, a formal independence. It really didn't matter because the structures of imperialism continued to operate in much the same way as before. And uh, so, you know, the, the rich countries will remain rich and the poor countries will remain poor and that's the end of the story. In reality, of course, it did matter a great deal. And I, one of my favorite statistics I like quoting is that in the first half of the 20th century, when India was still mostly under British rule until 1947, India's growth rate was next to zero. There are various estimates of this. There are various disputes about that. But they are sufficiently similar that we can for the moment take it for the sake of argument that it was near zero. In the second half of the 20th century, even though the first couple of decades or first three or four decades of growth were actually quite disappointing, 
Indian growth was 3.5%. It was so disappointing that people, economists used to make fun of it by calling it the Hindu rate of growth. Somehow India was caught in this trap of 3.5% and could not seem to break through it. Later on, of course, growth quickened. We can discuss the patterns of that as a separate matter. But 3.5% is a downside better than 0%. Yeah. And so independence did make a difference. It made a difference to the actual lives of people around the world. So those are, and sorry, um, where was I? <coughs> yes. And then the final, so, so, so very briefly, then the, the history of imperialism should be seen. In fact, imperialism has a history. It is not an eternal and unchanging structure. And therefore, we must try to understand exactly what time is it in a sense, in the history of imperialism today. What is the moment of imperialism within which we stand? Yeah. Uh, what does multipolarity mean for the history of imperialism? It certainly doesn't mean that dominant states are going to cease trying to exert their power over less powerful states. But short of that, it, makes, it, it, it is meaningfully a different type of configuration, and we try to understand that. And therefore, in the final argument is a two-part argument, so there is a connection between the two, um, that the uh, discourses of globalization and empire were the discourses of the last two attempts by the United States to fashion some semblance of dollar hegemony. The first was associated with the stock market bubble. The second was associated with the housing bubble in terms of the political economy of it. And of course, various discourses went along with that, and their relationship I discuss in my book in greater detail. But, uh, and of course, uh, along with these, there were also subsidiary discourses. Like in the case of globalization, there was the discourse of the new economy, the discourse of the hidden productivity miracle in the US economy, blah, blah, etc. And in the second, there was the, his, the discourse about how US house prices would keep going up, the great moderation, the global savings glut. You probably have heard about these expressions, and we can discuss uh, in particular their functionality to these two attempts to fashion something like uh, dollar dominance uh, in our discussion. So I've already spoken for quite a long time, and I've only arrived at my first <laughs> argument, but I'll try and race you through um, as, um, as, well, as quickly as I can. So the first argument, and, and of course I've said a lot of this, which is why I've taken a long time, so I will just pick the the bits that um, I want to um, emphasize. My first point is that states matter. And states matter in capitalist economies because, as Marx pointed out, capitalist economies are inherently contradictory. As Karl Polanyi pointed out, actually pure market societies are impossible. They, uh, they, they simply could not exist. Um, and as a consequence, of, for a variety of reasons, because capitalism has both internal economic contradictions, which periodically result in crisis, as well as political contradictions. For example, uh, as we know today, thanks to the Occupy movement, that it creates greater and greater inequality left to itself. So you need another agency to deal with the contradictions this generates, the flux that this generates, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, as I like to say sometimes, when the, vis when the invisible hand of the market shakes, the visible hand of the state has to come and steady it. Right? So in that sense, because of capitalism's contradictions, both political and economic, you need to have states playing a central role in this. And of course, uh, capitalism's development, once it starts developing and, and in a sense going beyond this, a single area or region or state, it inevitably has international repercussions. And these international repercussions and contradictions are best understood in terms of uneven and combined development. This is a very, uh, as I say, this uh, concept is generally, I call it Bolshevik. Most people attribute it to Trotsky. But I would say that um, there, are, uh, uh, there are other sources of it as well. But the central idea is very easy to explain. Uh, we are encouraged to think by the cosmopolitan discourses that capitalism spreads around the world smoothly and seamlessly, almost as though you poured water on a very flat surface and it sort of just spreads without you know, any, any obstruction. Um, in reality, uh, capitalism does not develop like that. Its development is inherently in lumps and clumps. So once capitalism develops in one part of the world, creating a lump of prosperity, it inevitably has <coughs> consequences for the rest of the world. Okay? 
uh, world system theory, of course, famously argued that the chief of these con chief among these consequences were that a large part of the rest of the world faces the danger of being colonized, and indeed it was. Okay, and this colonization was very functional to the maintenance and development for the development of capitalism in the home country, but. Not all territories of the world were colonized. They remained, at, they remained in existence even at the time of the earliest development of capitalism. Territories which, by not being colonized, retained national policy autonomy of a level and of a sort that allowed them to respond to this development in a way so as to emulate it and imitate it. So that once British capitalism developed, the G Germany, for example, the United States, Japan, in all of the, I'm just choosing the most successful examples, all of them engaged in some or the other version of what Trotsky called combined development. Combined referring merely to the sense that many and numerous phases are compressed. So they are combined into one period of time. So it's effectively referring to a hot housing or, or, or speeded up development. Uh, you can also call it compressed development. I like to use the term contender development, which is used by Case van der Paal, who's a, uh, uh, with whom I have interesting agreements and disagreements. But on this point, I think it's a wonderful term, which I think conveys, because they are contenders precisely because they, they, they immediately register what are the implications of British industrial supremacy. And that discourses like free trade are actually supports for this industrial supremacy. They must be rejected, they must be contested, and you must pursue a different path to development. I'll come to that. So uneven development in some parts of the world calls for the response <coughs> of the combined development. And this way of understanding um, the history of uh, the capitalist world is also very interesting because one of the most interesting questions, historical questions of our time and in fact of the modern era, of the capitalist era, is why is it that the development of capitalism has gone hand in hand with the generalization of the nation state systems around the world? Why did that happen? Right? It's not a question anybody asks. You know, people love to tell you, oh, all nations pretend that they are very ancient, but in reality, nations are very modern and they are right. They are quite modern. But then it doesn't then occur to people, say, well, why should capitalism, especially if you are encouraged to think of it as a single world market, why should it result in the pluralization of political jurisdictions around the world? And if you are going to try and understand that, you would have to understand something like uneven and combined development. I have three little quotes here, which all of which are quite interesting, and they kind of manage to give some life to the very general and abstract things I am saying. So Tom Nairn, uh, writer of a very important book on the uh, uh, British state, particularly the multinational character of the British state called The Breakup of Britain, um, argued, and he, uh, he does not refer to the theory of uneven and combined development, but he, this is exactly what it is about. And of course, he's an old Trotskyist, so there's no way he doesn't know the theory of uneven and combined development, although he does not refer to it. He says, the origins of nationalism do not lie in the folk or in the individual's repressed passion for some sort of wholeness or identity, but in the machinery of world political economy. Not, however, in the process of that economy's development as such, I'll skip over this a bit, but in the uneven development of history since the 18th century. This unevenness is a material fact. One could argue it is the most grossly material fact of modern history. The conclusion at once satisfying and near paradoxical is that the most notoriously subjective of historical phenomenon is in fact the byproduct of the most brutally and hopelessly material side of the history of the last two centuries. A couple of quick points about this. I, I always like to say that uh, contrary to what we are often taught to believe by post-colonial theorists and other such people who write about nationalism these days, about how na nations are cultural things, the first Indian nationalists did not sort of say, oh, well, we must, we, we want to become independent because our soul is being destroyed by British rule. In fact, there were a bunch of economists who said the British were draining India, they were plundering India, they were deindustrializing India, they were making India poor. It was fundamentally an economic argument, okay? Um, and and uh, the sec yeah. So 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 the point is that uh, one should really, um, yeah. 
Oh yes, and the second point I wanted to make is that today as well, one of the most important, again, talking about nations and nationalism, people do not understand that the chief distinction between nations are not distinctions of language or culture or whatever it is. It is the level of prosperity that you have. The fact is today, international inequalities are much greater than inequalities within countries. And this is the really, what this is, this is, what I understand when Tom Nairn refers to the most grossly material fact of world history. If you do not, if your understanding of the history of the world, the world capitalism does not contain an explanation of how this is the case, it is not an adequate history. In that sense, capitalism does not create only classes as a part of its natural operation, it also creates nations. Okay, class and nation are equally categories of um, uh, 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 of, of, of uh, uh, or equally material results in capitalism. Um, actually, I'll skip over this one in the interests of time. Uh, Benno Teschke, uh, uh, again, uh, another Trotskyist of some kind who does not, however, use uh, the term uneven and combined development, but this description is a description of nothing but uneven and combined development. He says, uh, and again, with whom I have also interesting agreements and disagreements, this is a bit about which we agree. He says the expansion of capitalism was not an economic process, not this kind of process of the pouring of water over a flat surface that I refer to, says market spread seamlessly around the world, uh, in which transnationalizing forces of the market or civil society surreptitiously penetrated pre capitalist states, driven by the logic of cheap commodities that eventually perfected the universal world market. It was a political and a fortiori geopolitical process in which pre-capitalist state classes, think Junkerdom, think uh, the northern uh, elites in the United States, think um, uh, uh, Japan's Meiji elite, etc. We are, this is what I, pre-capitalist state classes had to design counter strategies of reproduction to defend their position in an, in an international environment which put them at an economic and coercive or military disadvantage. More often than not, it was heavy artillery that battered down pre-capitalist walls. And the construction and reconstruction of these walls required a new, uh, a new state strategies of modernization. I would only, the only, I would demur here that I would not use the term geopolitical because it's too empty of economics. I would say geopolitical economy. But otherwise, I agree with this point. And uh, the point here is that, um, therefore, the develop, in a sense, you cannot understand the spread of productive capacity around the world without centrally putting states into your narrative, developmental states. Some were spectacularly successful, others were less successful, but they still were sufficiently successful to make a difference. We don't talk about them in the same breath, but they were there and they made a difference. Uh, in this narrative, then, imperialism becomes one of the ways in which dominant states try to maintain their dominance. One of the ways I take very seriously the idea, uh, which is often rejected by many Marxist economists as well as uh, so-called Keynesian economists, but I take very seriously the idea that capitalism, capitalism suffers from a chronic deficit of demand. Um, imperialism is a way of rectifying that. But it is, of course, then imposed by rich countries on poor countries, uh, and, the, at, and, and it's at the expense of poor countries that the contradictions of capitalism in rich countries are resolved, at least for a time. And then combined development is only the prerogative of those countries who have not been successfully colonized. This is another very, very important point. So as you can see, imperialism plays a big role in my book. This, the, 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 the function of discourses of free trade, uh, globalization, uh, he hegemony, stability theory, empire, etc., is precisely, on the one hand, to dissimulate the actions of imperial states in maintaining this division of labor, and on the other hand, if it is at all possible, to try to prevent contender development by saying you shouldn't intervene in markets, leave markets to do what they want, have free trade policies, have free market policies, etc., etc., and precisely, it was the theorists of national development, people like to, to take a paradigmatic example, Frederick List of Germany, who theorized contented development and said, we must reject free trade. We must be conscious of having, um, uh, we, must, we, we must consciously develop in an anti-free trade fashion. 
free trade is simply the ideology of England's industrial supremacy, and if we are going to contest that, we must uh, reject it. Um, and so, um, I, I will simply say here that part of the reason why we do not recognize some of these things is that too many economists, including too many critical economists, including the, uh, the, the followers of Keynes and Marx, actually do not accept what both Keynes and Marx pointed out, which is that you cannot, that, 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 that the Say's law, which says that capitalism does not suffer from a deficit of demand, and comparative advantage, which simply justifies the existing division of labor between high value or industrial countries, high value producing or industrial countries, and low value producing or agricultural countries. You have to reject both of these ideas as fictions before you can understand what's really going on in the world order. Okay, so then, and, and I will take maybe 10 more minutes, so I'll, I will go up over by about 10 minutes, I, I think, but I will try and summarize the rest very quickly then. So then if you understand that uneven development calls forth combined development, then you will see, understand that Britain being the first industrial capitalist country initially was very successful because it did not have industrial competitors. Its competitors were pre-industrial producers. It is very easy when you have factory production to lay waste the weavers of, I don't know, Indonesia or India or wherever else, where whose jurisdictions are not sufficiently strong and capable of defending their industry against this kind of competition. Um, so uh, in that sense, Britain is successful. Britain becomes the world's premier industrial power, the workshop of the world. All of these things are true. But by the late 18th, by, by 1870 or thereabouts, its industrial supremacy is beginning to be undermined. Very interesting this date, 1870. Um, Germany has been united. Uh, the United States has finished the major problem, finished or has resolved the major problem. Um, that it faced between its early independence and, and this time, which is that the South was persistently free trade and, um, of course, slave owning, etc. So the, 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 the victory of the North was not just about slavery. It was also as much about using protectionism in order to industrialize America, explicitly rejecting the idea that America should remain an agricultural appendage of the British economy, supplying the cotton that she needed, etc., etc. So, 1870, so 1860, Civil War also resolves that question. And of course, Japan has its Meiji restoration just around this time. So, these countries are now able to mount their respective contender development, combined development challenges. So, by this time, British industrial supremacy is at an end, although it retains a certain commercial supremacy in the era up to 1914 and a financial supremacy, but even that you can show, and I discuss this in my book, is declining right the way through. Um, I won't discuss uh, these uh, theoretical issues, although I can bring them up in uh, 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 problems, but one thing I will note since this is an international relations and politics school is that we are taught in politics 101 or international relations 101, our introductory international relations, that you know the discipline of international relations arose at the end of the First World War when you know public diplomacy, blah, blah, etc. In reality, if you think about it, the classical theories of imperialism, which, whose first work was actually not Marxist, it was written by a social democrat called John Hobson, who was an important precursor of Keynes. Um, but uh, but which, uh, after Hobson, a series of Marxists, Luxembourg, Lenin, Hilferding, Bukharin, they all wrote in different ways about precisely why is it that capitalist nations were building up to war. These are the first theories of international relations, in my view. Or first conscious, that, I mean, well, let me rephrase that. They were certainly earlier than what we are told about Wilsonian idealism and then E.H. Carl makes his intervention. And this deserves, this, ha this has uh, got a few paragraphs in my book that you will be interested in. So, then out of this second argument, or the second part of this argument is that the US uh, did not achieve hegemony, but this was not for lack of trying. Indeed, the attempts were there and they were very zealous, in part because as a number of very critical writers of US hegemony have pointed out, 
um, the U.S. was an imperial republic. It was it was an ex it was expansionist and imperialist from the beginning. It understood that that's what it should do is continue to expand. By 1870, its continental expansion was over. It was beginning to look overseas, and by the early 20th century, leading policymakers and capitalist uh, big capitalists had begun to formulate very consciously the the idea that the United States could, if it tried replace the UK, and this is in their words, as the managing segment of the world economy. In fact, if you think about it, hegemony stability theory is less a theory and, than a theorization of a desire. Didn't work. Of course, by the early 20th centuries, it was impossible for the United States to actually emulate the UK in a fully, because one thing was impossible is to acquire an empire that was as, as extensive as that of the UK. It would simply be prohibitively expensive, cost way more than the United States was willing to shell out for this. So they said, well, forget about the colonies, however. But what we will do is we will replace the do sterling with the dollar as the world's money and make uh, New York rather than London the world's financial center. So this was the US aim. And by the way, those of you who take an interest in hegemony stability theory will have at least experienced some frustration, if you read at all extensively into this, at the varying definitions of hegemony. I have decided to completely sidestep the vexing, this vexing issue, partly it's, uh, for me it's even more vexing because after a while I no longer believe that there was such a thing as hegemony. So what was the point of wading into a literature which was discussing something that did not even exist? My point is I simply take this US, the, this, this, this desire of US policymakers as the benchmark of my, I measure US performance against this benchmark. That is my definition of hegemony. And I also show how this relates, by the way, to hegemony stability theory as Carl Charles Kindleberger in particular originated it. So, um, and, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the US policymaking elites are more or less as collectively uh, pursuing this in a more or less conscious fashion. The, after the First World War, they failed disastrously. Again, I talk about this in my book. But our Second World War is the point at which they get their biggest chance of doing this. It is true that at the end of the first, before the First World War, the United States was the biggest capitalist country in the world in terms of its GDP. What was not true, and probably would never have been true without the intervention of the wars, is that the US would come to account for half the world's production. But that is what happened, and it was entirely a result of the war, because the war destroyed productive capacity among the warring capitalist countries. But the United States, Beyond Pearl Harbor, it suffered no damage at home. Indeed, on the contrary, not only was US industry saved by being so far away from the theaters of war, but in fact, the US economy actually doubled in size in the course of performing the role of the supplier of raw war material. Between 1939 and 1945, the US economy doubled in size. That is what brought it to the point where in 1945, it accounted for half of the world's production. Without war, this would have been impossible. Okay, you should not, you should really, I must emphasize this. Now it uses its power at Bretton Woods to say, no bank hall, no uh, 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 fancy currency arrangements for more saner, more democratic international governance in which many countries would have a say. The dollar is going to be the world's money. That's it, right? Um, and and you think, okay, they had the power. They must have the dollar. Must have been the world's money. Wrong. Throughout the 1950s, the dollar uh, is not playing as, uh, an adequate role as the world's money simply because it is too scarce. Why is it too scarce? Because at this point in time, the United States is engaged in a major export drive. An export drive uh, which is served by the declaration of the Cold War so that the United States can give military aid to all sorts of countries. Uh, Turkey, Greece episode is a very central episode in all of this. Then the United States, uh, and yeah, in general, the United States can give a certain amount of export credit, but you know what? It is not even enough to keep U.S. exports up to the rate that they would have liked. Okay. 
And by the way, U.S. policymakers are trying not just to keep up the relative, the, the absolute size of the U.S. economy, which can be understandable because people don't want to have sudden unemployment, you know, post-war unemployment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they were also trying to see if they could maintain the United States' relative dominance. Uh, okay, I, I have to. Uh, I, there are many important points I'm going to have to miss. But by 1958, the moment that European currencies become convertible, overnight the dollar shortage turns into a dollar glut. And for those of you who do not know, already by uh, 1971 was not did not happen overnight. In fact, it had a decade-long prelude. By 1961, already you, the United States was forced to marshal other people's gold in order to back the uh, dollar with gold. Uh, uh, the gold pool uh, also became basically de facto defunct by the late 60s. So by the time the gold window was closed in 1971, it was only a final ceremony marking the end of something that had effectively ended long before. Um, so in that sense, and then, you know, a lot of people take 1971 and say, oh, wasn't, it, wasn't Nixon so daring? He knew that the dollar would remain the world's money even after breaking the gold link, etc. This was a masterstroke. Rubbish. Nothing of the kind. If you actually read the historical record, Nixon was acting in, in desperation. Um, uh, in order to save the U.S. economy, he sacrificed the dollar's gold link. Nobody was at all certain how it would all turn out. And then a final few points. Since then, what looks like continuous dollar dominance is in reality a series of financializations, which now the dollar's world role depends on, uh, in order to essentially uh, 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 create wide acceptance for the dollar, you have to have a great deal of international capital flows, which are moreover dollar denominated. Uh, so you then have a series of financializations. And one graphical picture of this is this one. It's not my graph, but I find it really interesting. It goes from 1940 to 2000 and you can see and these are just international capital flow outflows so it is just in one direction um, you can see here that these uh, uh, straight lines are the United States outflows from the US so this is what basically is the extent of martial aid and those sorts of things and military aid of various sorts uh, of course Vietnam expenditures etc and it is only after 1972 73 when oil prices go up that this base becomes the basis of the biggest, one of the biggest of the financializations. And this here is the recycling of oil surpluses. This here is Japanese financing in the 1980s of the US twin deficits. This is the East Asian crisis. And of course, you are only seeing the beginnings of what would be an enormous, much bigger, I would say, roughly, I'm just guessing, uh, a, a stock market bubble and an even bigger, off the charts, um, housing bubble, international financial flows related to the housing bubble. And these are the financializations that have kept the dollar in business throughout. Uh, their purpose has been to direct uh, uh, international capital flows have been justified. Uh, the lifting of capital controls by various countries has been justified by saying that it would uh, employ capital in pr productively around the world. In reality, the function of these international capital flows has been to direct flows into the United States. I will come back to this if you want. Uh, I will skip this actually entirely and simply show you a couple of um, last few things. Most of us think globalization discourse is very <coughs> old. These are statistics compiled by Ben Fine, in which you can see articles on globalization are more or less non-existent, but, and they take off in the late 90s, and they level off in the early 2000s. I did a similar thing with books, with the keyword of subject globalization. Again, you see a very similar pattern and an even more pronounced leveling off. Why it levels off rather than declines, we can also discuss. Um, this is a, a <coughs> graph I'd just like to, I mean, I, I don't know how many of you are interested in financial matters, we can discuss them more briefly, but the, uh, contrary to the notion that the dollar has been doing very well, in fact, if you look at the secular trend here, it has been declining throughout ever since 1971 when the dollar's gold link was broken with only two major interruptions. This is the Volcker shock of the 1980s. Those of you who have studied it will remember that it induced a huge recession in the United States itself, and it was necessary to shore up the value of the US dollar. 
And the only other measure that has ever made the value of the US dollar go up since then in a sustained way was the stock market bubble we associate with globalization, which was helped along by Alan Greenspan uh, effectively to manufacturing a load of nonsense about the new economy and the productivity miracle in the US economy, all of which was just really hot air and nothing much more than that. Uh, interesting thing here is that its successor bubble, uh, which has been important for the United States economy, has at best prevented the dollar from falling even faster. Um, so I believe that, and I will show you um, <coughs> one other graph uh, for the moment. I have a few others which we can discuss. But this is the one where you can see that this is from 1980 onwards, and you can see this is the stock market bubble, this is the housing bubble peak. And after the housing bubble peak, after 2008, there is a steep drop and a further drop. And then there is a recovery. But what's really interesting about this recovery is that it is not going to take international capital flows back to the same point. And it will, they will not continue growing in the same way as they had done before. Okay, so the point is that there is today an interruption of the, I'm not saying it's a complete cessation, and uh, we can discuss the ins and outs of it, but my view is that this interruption is more or less permanent, that the dollar's role cannot go on for much longer to be the, 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 as big as it, as it was. Um, this is a, a quick uh, graph showing you, uh, actually, maybe this is the best. Um, the share of the dollar in international financial transactions from 2001 to 2010. The only thing you should know about this is that these percentages are not percentages from <coughs> Uh, 100, which is a funny thing to say, but they are not per 100, but per 200, because they always, that's how they measure and calculate financial transactions. And here, this is the dollar share of official foreign exchange reserves, which uh, in 2010 was already 61%. Uh, I would expect this to continue to go down for a number of the reasons. So um, another uh, graph that shows you uh, declining role of the dollar, rising role of the euro. This is a very important part of the story. And now other currencies' role in a foreign exchange reserves is also going up. Um, so um, I think that I will end here. So basically my point here is that increasingly the United States attempt effectively to sides to, 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 to um, scuttle any other more collective form of e international economic governance, uh, it's increasingly failing. You can see that at least at a regional basis, uh, whether it is the BRICS Development Bank or the Chiang Mai Initiative or whatever, there are a number of agree uh, arrangements coming up ar around the world, uh, which are already showing that it is possible for countries to get together and sidestep the problematic role of the dollar. Uh, and it is increasingly happening because it is very problematic for people. There's a lot more to say, but I've gone on for enough. So I think I will end here, and I look forward to discussing whatever uh, out of what I said that has really caught your fancy. So thank you very much. For that.